What I think I'll do is I'll support that with the tail stock again. We'll get some tissue on the inside of that and, and support it. You've got plenty there. How much do you want? That'll be perfect. Thank Let you. you scrunch it in the way you like it to be scrunched. So the tail stock can come back up. And our little plug. That's all it is, just a little plug of tissue. We're going to put soft support from the tail stock on there next. So, when you bring the tail stock up, remember ring center, not a single point in center. That's really important. You want a good bearing surface. Give yourself a little bit of room from the tail stock. If you're ever you're unsure, just grab the, the live center and just give it a twist. See how much pressure you need to twist that center. That'll give you an idea how much pressure is on that uh, that bit of tissue. And if I can do that, if I can actually make the whole thing rotate by moving the tail sock center, I know I've got a good amount of pressure on there. Okay, so that's all nicely supported. Let me speed back to zero again, turn the lathe on, and I'm gonna start off by just cleaning the surface, giving myself an idea where to put the parting tool, or where the, the parting tool needs to be to part off. So let's do another shear cut with that gouge up to about 1500 to 1600 revs, part is fine. And remember, we want to keep this as big as possible, this diameter. The idea is to have it slightly bigger than the actual chalice top. There, done. Right, so now I can start removing some waste. Oh, no, I can't. I need to do what I've just suggested. Give myself an idea where we're going to pass off in a moment. So I'm using a, a 1 8 parting. So I'm going to tool some room by doing a, a half cut next to this one. And then we'll just do a little overtaking cut, just going to each cut separately, taking it down. There we are. That's giving me my idea of where I'm finishing. So let's remove some waste. And we'll do the next section. I'll just do enough to create that ball neck. I won't do too much of this, the bottom of this, this stem no, here. No, I won't, no, because it sneaks up on you. The, um, the gradual flowing up to the waist below that feed, as we were going to call it, um, it, it, it sneaks up. It's really sort of um, subtle. Yeah, okay. So it's easy to take too much material away. I go down there. Give you enough size. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Let's go from it's slightly smaller. So I'll go with this spindle gauge. Again, create some room. Uh, now visually, just for myself, I'm just going to put a high spot on that bead, so I know where it is, so I don't lose it. And then we can come back from both ends. It'll be very easy to lose where that position of that bead is, but once we've got the high spot in there, um, you can follow it quite easily. I'm thinking then for these non-talking parts, we could have some 
um, ukulele or some banjo picking music yeah. going on. We are in Tennessee, there should be some you have banjo picking music going on in the background, isn't there? <laughs> any of our students play banjo or play Can do any with you? Oh, never mind. <laughs> But that'd, that'd be good late time of music, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. Maybe it's speed up production. So that's looking great and nice and over-exaggerated where we're going to decorate that bead neck. Just swinging that tool around. Great practice for spin return in this project. A little bit challenging at times, but it really, it really, um, it really tweaks your turning. It's just getting that muscle memory back, um, tuned in. I know if I ever get any uh, jobs to do, you know, if people want um, some gift items that are spindle turned, and it's not always been my uh, desire to make 50 or something. <laughs> you have to pay the bills, right? But after you do, uh, this sort of project, you, it really does um, hone your turning, it really does. There we are, what do you reckon on that mate? Is that okay with a bit of abrasive on there? Let's come in and have a look. Oh yeah! Well I don't think I've done a better job myself, so it's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, and you even left your pencil line just to show off at the top of the field. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I'll sand that. And don't forget, as we go on this project, that we need to clean up where we've been. Now, when I go back with the second coat, I've got to make that decision. I could, of course, put some tape around there to stop me going over. But right now, I'm going to sand this area here and that bead, and then we're going to decorate the bead. So we'll get on with that one, and you're back on the, uh, in the camera office. Yeah, on the off in the office, the operating studio. So I find that um, folding the abrasive, of course, gets up into those little areas just nicely and you'll watch this smoky part disappear here. But otherwise, if we come from underneath, we can see the areas we want to hit. And try not to lose those really detailed areas that Cole is just left on the top, the nice top of that neck there where it just holds. This design holds the cup instead of it flowing into the, uh, the stem flowing into the cup there. It just separates that form nicely and, and supports it. So I'm going to sand that bead. Just carefully. Uh, even use my little finger to get into that curve. Occasionally I might even uh, glue a piece of abrasive to a dowel if I've got some more difficult cones shape to get into. You pass me a couple of other grits, there's 240. And we'll go 320, 400. So we are using soft maple today, um, or ambrosia maple if it's got those lovely colours going through it. And it's a little bit between um, I don't know, a little bit between our sycamore and something a little softer, isn't it, Colin? Mm. Really nice wood to turn. There's the 400. Very easy wood to turn. And it takes colour and it carves well. Okay, so now we're going to come back to the... Um, there's a bit of what you call the ambrosia going through it right there. You can see uh, that's caused by a worm. So you only get pattern or stain where the worm has been entering the wood and there's actually you can see where the colour stops right on that bark inclusion and it's an interesting wood when you get multiple streaks through it it really is beautiful <coughs> okay let me take the smaller of the tools again and of course this one fits into the the corner a little better so <laughs> slow speed down we only need it two three hundred Get into that corner. Walked a little bit on me there. Um, it can be on a curved surface. So if I just push straight onto the curved surface, it's only going to do one thing. It's going to move downhill, isn't it? It's going to follow the shape. 
So I'm actually pivoting on to the surface at the point I want the tool to do its texturing or make the patterns and trying to hold it still. Um, uh, that even caught, caught me a little bit. But as long as you um, are aware of that, everything should go to plan. Let's use the larger cutter there. And I think we've got room for the big boy just at the top. Now this one has a bearing in it, so it won't undo, so I can actually turn this one around and come in from the underside. And that should leave me enough room now to come back with my jewellery uh, cup there. Now I'm not sure um, that I can to sell these, but that's what it is. And you could absolutely use your pyrography uh, instead and do whatever design you like on that and I'm sure Cole and Ben would come up with something super fancy on here if we left him alone for an hour or two. In fact I might do that, I'll just send some to Ben, he can do the decorating. Collaborating is just a fun thing to do sometimes isn't it? Yeah. And if somebody else is really good at something, rather than trying to do it all yourself, you can sometimes come up with a really unique uh, opportunity and, and piece of work. Okay, that at least has some marriage with the design that's going on uh, from, from the cup here to, to the base. So we're going to repeat the process that we did on the cup. A little bit of burnishing. Pulling that number of 400 if you've got it there, Colin. Thank you. Just deal with that. With the dust, and I'm going to take the black Chromacraft rib there. Again, straight out of the bottle, undiluted. That's what it's meant to do. It is a resonated rib die, so it bonds with the wooden surface. It's, it's, if you, um, it's amazing stuff. If you were to spray a stencil, as a lot of you have seen me do, you can literally rub your hand over the area you've just sprayed uh, a, a butterfly or something for example and you just won't see it it's um you won't feel it rather it's uh quite amazing stuff right i need another glove back on with the glove and then we're going back on with that silver viking silver gilt and of course there are lots of other colors you can choose if you'd like to do it you know we're going to do, show you gold on the inside of the cup a little bit later. Once again, I'm going to put this on with it rotating slowly. I've got this one down at about 300. Always be careful if you're wearing jewellery, you know, on your fingers when you're doing this. You actually scar the work. And of course, wearing a glove, be ultra careful that you don't press the hard and give yourself a friction burn, which wouldn't be pleasant. All right, that's got that first coat on. I'm going to go back now, really gently by hand, with it stationary. You see it just makes it a little bit more shiny. Then I'm going to sand off where I've overdone it a little bit and hit the original area. But still pre-sanding, just so I have to just touch that area up. And we're working fast, of course, today. You've got a little bit more time when you're making this, I hope, in your own time. Right, we'll take the 240 or 320. Where have we got one hiding here somewhere? Yeah, the, the amazing touch of Colin May. <laughs> Deciding which grid it might be. Because you don't ride it on everything, do they? We should have done that, really. Those are 240. And then we'll go to the 320 or 400, just to clean it up so it's not really needing to be over aggressive. Right, we're just about there for the moment. That'll keep us happy for the time being. 
Right, back over to you, Colin. Nice one, thank you, Nick. Okay, so next stage, we've got to um, finish the, the, the stem here. So back with the turning. I'm going to stick with the 3-8 bowl gouge just to start with, and then we'll go back to spindle gouge just to do some refining uh, right at the very end. But remember what Nick was saying earlier. We want to keep this um, a fair amount of mass in here, so it's going to be a fairly gentle slope. We're not going to go too thin on the base. It's going to deflect from the, from the design of the piece if we do that. So similar cuts to what I was doing here before. Lay speed up to about the same 15, 1600 is fine. And just take your time. Watch the shape grow. So don't go any thinner on this area here. We're happy with the thickness there, but we want to take the length away. And I want to maximize the length as well. Not always you may decide, actually, I don't need the whole length. And that'll be fine. You can part off a little bit sooner. But we want to part off where I've already put the marks. Just keep growing that curve. It's just easier to refine if you do it a little bit at a time. You said some collars on the base as well, similar to what we've got up here. Yeah, we want something that's not, it doesn't want to be too mean. Well, we no. don't need just like a centimetre. We need something that's sort of two centimetres, um, a little band on the bottom. Got it. And you can put whatever detail you like uh, in it. Uh, but maybe for starters, keep it simple, stupid. That's the advice. Can you hear something in that wood there? I'm going to stop the way just to sit, just so I know we get no surprises. <laughs> it's creeping, isn't it? Yeah, I can it. see it down here in the Who would have known that we had a little bit of bark inclusion earlier on, but that's right, it's uh, medieval, so it would have been there then, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, I always find it really interesting because something, something has happened in that year of growth. Hidden inside the wood. To damage the timber. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. sort of never know it was in there. Would little you? time capsule, isn't it? Something's happened. I think we're okay. Yeah. Design opportunities, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we've never got the excuse to be bored. It is always full of surprises, never take it for granted. And listening, as you probably heard over the microphone there, listening for those challenges, um, because it could be a potential hazard or a split. How many times have you found a male or a staple? A little bit of Devon countryside timber. I remember turning some wood from Slapton one time, Colwyn, and uh, it was some really nice trees I was given, and it was full of shrapnel. Yeah. From some of the practice they did down there, and uh, yeah, it wasn't much, wasn't much good. It's a common thing. It's really, you didn't realise how common it is to get little slugs, you know, little, yeah, and little bullets pellets, and things. Yeah. Often from shotguns. Yeah. And a lot of the timber. I'm just going to put my little band there and I'm going to come up here with another tool in a minute. I'm going to probably put this, a, a little skew cut in there just to get that line defined a little bit more. But that, um, that little inclusion is really done in the tool quickly. Yeah, often, um, you know, maple, the maple family will carry silica in it anyway, which is, you know, glass or sand if you want to put it any other way. And, and silica uh, dulls the tool edge very quickly, and of course there's going to be a compounded amount of it anywhere near a knot or a bark inclusion. A lot of you would have turned you back in the UK, 
and those white lines you see in the cracks of the yew tree are silica and you'll know also that they stole the tool. That was, that was great, but just leave that area a little bit more. So yesterday was the 4th of July, so we, we stayed up a little bit later to see the 4th of July fireworks. Some of the group had a, a visitor, or they were waiting for the fireworks, oh, yes. <laughs> fireworks to come along. Someone shouted bear, or looked up and said bear, and there was a bear just wandering yeah, outside, the feet 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 outside the library. And somebody said bear! They said it was probably a, a half-grown a half one. So not too scary. Black bears around here in the Smoky Mountains. But just as you might see a badger at home, but badgers do come up to homes as do foxes, don't they? But Mr. Bear was on his wander around, but I expect he went to bed once he heard the fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> so Black yeah. Bear was full of all sorts of exciting things. You may have seen um, on some of our posts. There was everything here from crazy golf, uh, a lot, all sorts of. Um, smells of food down the street, including old-fashioned candy twisting machines, and there is a video somewhere online of a bear breaking into the candy store and having a good old feast. <laughs> uh, uh, he literally pushed the glass in the bottom of the door, wandered in, and helped himself to a load of uh, twisted candy, and uh, then went on his way. <laughs> <laughs> Who can blame them? It's my first time here in, uh, at Aramont teaching and um, as tutors we have a safety brief at the beginning and part of that safety brief is what to do when you encounter a bear on campus. Yeah. That was a very much an eye. Yeah, that made your eyes wide enough there, didn't it? Okay. okay. Yeah. There they are, Nick. Um, if I could just, is there a 240? We would have heard it somewhere. It's miraculously disappeared. Ah, fair. A lovely job. Right, 2.40 and then Nick can take over again. Is that little band. 400. There we are, mate, I think. I think that's okay. What do you reckon? Let's see what you got. Perfect. Perfect, yeah. Now, um, we're just going to ignore the fact that that bark inclusion is there, but as you've got a grain direction change in here, you could actually apply a punch to this. Now you'd have to stay away from any edges because uh, that's going to break the wood. But this is end grain, the grain direction is flowing in this way. Side grain doesn't punch so well, it wants to bounce back something if you indent the material with something that's dull or blunt. But as we are, have a sweep this way, whilst you might be thinking it's um, side grain, it's part end grain because we've cut through those end grain fibres uh, and that if you do have any punches uh, will work really well. I'm going to stick with what we've got here uh, and keep some uniformity uh, between this design. Um, so we're going to go with a bigger tool in the bottom once more and uh, we'll get a little bit of a, a mixture just using this one tool this time dancing through those different areas. It really does um, show how much just one tool can do if you use your imagination. Moving down from above so I can see the various places that the, um, the teeth are going to cut and actually the dust is left on the end of um, those little teeth since Colin sanded it and I didn't clean it off. Pretty useful for you to see. Open a little bit more to perhaps one o'clock. Move the space. Pull up right again, and then back up to about two o'clock. So we'll have a look at our design. That's looking perfect. Back in with my little cut bear again. And as I said, your pyrography is certainly going to be an asset for taking this that little bit further. Uh, a little bit more time. Just remember if you are using pyrography, don't be fooled by the illusion of a burnt line. It must be into the surface so that you can actually feel it 
rather than just see it. That's going to be uh, pretty important. Otherwise, you won't get the illusion we're looking for when we go across to get that gilt on the surface. <coughs> Once more, do mind your hands on the uh, chuck jaws there. And of course, no long hair or uh, long sleeves near anything spinning. Okay, so back with the airbrush. That one's feeling okay this time. Don't need to sand it. It's because you had practice, wasn't it, as you went through? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually good. I mean, don't sand it when it doesn't need it. Again, when you use the airbrush, you can almost touch the wood, and the double action airbrush gives me the chance to slowly bring the paint on. Now, you, you're better off starting in the middle, actually, rather than on the edge like I do, because then if you suddenly go, whoops, and spray a bit too much, it's not going to be um, a nuisance. So, I'm literally a few millimetres, or I might say an eighth of an inch, off the surface with that. I don't want to touch it, of course, because it's going to be... Uh, not such a good day for the airbrush. And I'm leaning out of camera, I'm just leaning on the tool rest for uh, stability. You do get through a few gloves doing this, uh, and of course you can turn it inside out, but if you go back to using the same glove each time, you'll probably find that the gilt has started to dry on it, and you, you'll lose the control of that ease of application. Um, when we've pyrographed or scorched the area, it'll always be shiny, and the shiny bit there where the bark is, is where the um, dye sealer is just sitting on the surface a little bit. So I'm just going to wipe that off, basically because it hasn't soaked into the timber. It's just repelled it. That's all we can find. Now, where's my silver gone? Did you hide it? No, I hid it from myself. I put it on the top of the lathe where, of course, we all will. Once again, Slow, slow rotation with it on the finger. You could use a brush for this, um, but of course the brush is going to invite the gill into that lower regions of the texture where we don't want it. Um, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. And there's a technique called dry brushing where you feel very careful. A dry brush is cut off more like a deer's hoof um, in its angle and it just hits the high notes of your surface rather than a lower texture. It takes a little bit of practice. I don't know, some of the students here with this week, we did a two-week class a few years ago with the master of that dry brush in Jacques Tavessery. He's just an amazing artist. If you haven't heard of him, look him up. He's in Maine, the Mariscot of Maine over here in the US. And uh, yeah, mind-blowing work. Okay. We're about there. So, um, finishing on this is going to be entirely up to you. You're, you could oil this, you could wood toning, friction polish this, uh, wood toner, stick wax, whatever is your game. Um, but I would still personally leave this now for some hours and go back and do my second coats. Um, so they've got that finish as bright as I want before I go on with the next bit. And just remember if you're going to be putting a liquid on, uh, that liquid to allow the whatever is in the liquid, um, it's going to potentially pull some of that colour off if you get it over everything. Same if you're going to be fogging a lacquer over it. Fogging is the deal first. If you get up close and spray everything, then the liquid in that is potentially going to pull <coughs> some of that finish off. So remember what we've got on the surface, different places for different products, and all should be good. Actually, this one, I would probably just lacquer because I really like the way the wood's doing some of the talking in there. Let's move up to the end. Uh, before we get cold, to part it off, and we'll be done. Won't take long, so I'm going to take the tail stock away. Move that on back out. Just blow the dust out. Then we're going to go back in with the black, followed by the sealer. One last time, then we're going to get the Egyptian gold, which is an amazing colour. It really is. It's one of the newer ones uh, from Crumber Craft. Pulled out a bit. There's something in there. I could hear it. When you pulled up, me, I thought, that sounds weird. There we go. <laughs> How fun is that? The bang. Now, you can put whatever colour you like in here. 
uh, you may want to put um, you know, a green gold or something like that inside. Uh, I tend to back up my look with this with a little bit of the black underneath the gold. That might sound strange, but undercoats are, are important for a look. Um, just like we undercoat the paint in our own homes, uh, it's important to do the same underneath some of these gilts. You don't have to, there's no law, but you'll find that it just looks that little bit better. Okay, one more cloth. Now this time I won't be doing this larger area with it spinning now, I'm going to do this one by rotating the lathe with my hand. And I, I'm not sure whether we're in the right place with the camera, but hopefully you'll be able to see. And we're going to put this on pretty thick. This is a really bright gold. Um, you can see it looks like gold leaf in a tube. Um, and it will need, again, two coats, but we're going to put this one on in a bit more of a greedy style. I tend to find that putting it on and being able to rotate the lathe just gives it a more authentic look than if I was taking it um, by hand on the finished piece, parted off the lathe. I think that the, if I can do it this swept around fashion, it just looks better. Now, whether it's the particle size in the, in the product that makes this look good or, or just the color, I don't know, but it really works. But of course, this one is going to take two coats and, and the, the thickness I'm putting this on, it will take a little bit more time to dry. I might have to just pop my head in front of the camera there to see um, inside a minute, Colin. Thank you. So I can see what I'm doing. And a bit like a, a potter, I'm going to bring my finger back up the side of the wall as I'm rotating it. And we'll now let that dry for a couple of hours, really, at the very least. But you'll see that it really does. We go back to that shot a minute. Here we go, the cam. It starts to make the inside glow. The other camera, camera number 23, please. <laughs> that one. You see how that, uh, when you going to hold up in a minute, it starts to invite almost a glow from the inside. And that really captures the light, even low light, even candlelight. It yeah. really comes alive. So uh, I'm going to leave you to um, try not to get that all over yourself, as, yeah. you, as you now part it off. Lovely. Thanks, mate. Okay. So parting off, we're going to go straight in with the the one eighth uh, bowl gouge. What we need to make sure when we part off is that the tailstock isn't engaged. If you have a tailstock there and you're pinching between the two centers as you part off, things will go wrong quite quickly. It will buck all of a sudden and then most likely go across the table, um, go across the lathe, or, or your tool will get pinched and come out your hand. So give yourself room. Um, we're going to pop the tool rest in close to where my work is, but I'm giving the actual um, chalice a little bit of space here where I'm going to grab there because there will be movement it will move around a little bit um, and I'm going to take my time I'm going to repeat the two cuts as I go down with a parting tool I'm going to do one cut another cut next cut and so on just giving room for the tool to move on each each of those cuts um, and be patient you'll get down or you should get down certainly on this material to and they're about a one eighth nib to clean up after and of course, it's slightly different the way um, we would normally do this. Normally, we would uh, reverse this around, hold with a, a, a drive in this end, um, probably a wooden friction drive, something like that, and a tailstock, and clean that underside up nicely. But we're just going to part off like you would a normal vase, that sort of thing, just for a bit of speed. So there, my tool rest is right in the perfect position. I'm slightly undercutting the base, so we've got a dish thin underside, so that means it won't rock around on the table, basically. And I'm doing one cut after the other. Once I get down to about half inch, I'll then start supporting it with my left hand. So then about five eighths there. Half inch. So what I'm going to do is carefully retract the tool, get myself comfortable, bring my hand around, 
and support. That's all I'm doing. I'm supporting. I'm not holding tight. If you hold tight, your hand will get hot and you'll let go. So again, things go wrong very soon. So look, I'm holding the, the parting tool up nice and close. And being careful as I go into the cut, it's ever so really easy at this stage just to nick the corner. And then we're back to the marking tools in there, so there we have. It could be a surprise in there, it could come off uh, before you're ready. So sooner than you think, rather. Gentle cut, so I'm cutting on around about the, the centre point. I can feel a wobble there now, so just support. And notice that Colwyn's hand is not on fire. So he's yeah. got a really loose hold there, so he's actually got a little bit of air uh, between his fingers and thumb. Yeah. But he's in touch with the wood. And you can and feel it by uh, just wiggle, you can see the, the goblet move. So I'm in full control of it there. And then just gently up and down over the centre point. We're down to about, we well, less than an eighth at the moment, and it's still running itself. All that's going to happen is it's going to stop in my hand there. And that just leaves us that little, that little amount just to tidy up. And you can see how far that bark inclusion went in. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it went in a fair old way. So there we are, let's... Have that goblet up. Fantastic Nick. job. Come on in, Nick. So there we are. There's a lot of technique going on in there. I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, I certainly did. It's lovely to collaborate every now and again because yeah. things happen. That's the, the magic of collaboration. So a nice little dual project. And we'd on improve there. on that if we did it again. You know, every time. Um, the surprise in the wood, I don't think it's detrimental. No. It's an aged look to this one. So, but that's wood turning, isn't it? You, you, there's all sorts of surprises going on. But yeah, bunch of fun. We have a, a chalice. And now <laughs> these guys um, can go and make one. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and thank you everybody for joining us, uh, both over here uh, across the pond. Colin, good to have you here, my friend. And um, we've only got about another 6,000 miles. That's good, I was going to say, really cool. So we're off out on a road trip, um, road trip. We're off out on a, a little photography trip in a minute. So we're hopefully going to give you a little gallery of what the guys here have been making, show you some of the faces, some of the well-known faces. Um, but don't forget, remember what I always say. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share us around as much as possible. And we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.